So thank you so much uh, for joining all of you. Uh, we have with us today uh, Larif Imdad from uh, Head Start uh, Pui campus, um, Josefa from, uh, uh, he's a co-founder of Young Patriot School, uh, Hassan, CEO and co-founder of Sabaks. Uh, Hassan, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have Rabia, Chaud Rabia Chaudhary, uh, who's a fellow teaching fellow at Teach for Pakistan. Uh, and then we have uh, Rabia uh, from Hak Academy. She's a counselor at Hak Academy. So thank you so much. Our uh, today's topic is uh, the changing role of schools, schools in this uh, post-corona uh, world. We are all in a very unique situation mein hai because um, it's something that all of a sudden, you know, the entire world is in a very confused state. Uh, the entire, you know, businesses are shut down, our schools are closed down, uh, and we don't know for how long this will continue. And uh, in this way, there are aspects hai, uh, to talk. Um, there's an aspect yeah. with families, with the students, um, the teachers, the management. Uh, um, you know, we can talk about the well-being of students in this time. Uh, the role of schools, as we've seen in the past, you know, it's completely evolving now. And uh, our students' ki needs, and uh, it's very important to talk about ke, uh, you know, is context mein now, what are the needs of our students and how we need to uh, evolve as individuals and as organizations to meet those needs. So thank you once again, uh, everyone, for joining us. Uh, so my first from all the panelists, um, if you can talk about how you and your organizations are adapting to this change and to this new world, uh, maybe Hassan, if you could start the conversation for us. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting us and uh, taking uh, sort of the Syed, uh, the content producer's uh, uh, story. So interestingly, my organization, we are about a team of 25 to 30 people. And I think on the 21st or the 20th, uh, uh, the Monday, uh, the week in which the lockdown happened, uh, just uh, a few days before that, we all decided as a team that we would start doing work from home. And uh, most of our team members are engineers, uh, software developers, content producers, animation folks, and uh, curriculum designers. So they all could work from a laptop. And uh, when we started working, right away, we realized how much we didn't need to be in the same room. <laughs> So uh, work from home has worked out fairly well for us. And we uh, very actively uh, have a daily huddle of all the supervisors at 10.30 in the morning in which we all share with each other what each of the team will be working on. And uh, immediately as we uh, continued with our uh, ongoing product plans, we also started to modifying and adapting our products so that it could be utilized by parents at home. We made our uh, award-winning learning app news free for all parents and all schools during the coronavirus shutdown. Uh, and uh, that has uh, increased uh, the usage on our platform. Uh, another thing we did is we uh, collaborated with the Federal Department of Education, uh, where we offered all of our learning videos and content for free to the government uh, to be used during the coronavirus shutdown. And now on the 10th, I think, or the 12th of April, they will be launching a dedicated 12 hour transmission on one of the PTV channels in which uh, for kindergarten to grade five level uh, time slots, they will be using a lot of our content and content from a couple of other partners. Uh, and now we're talking to the Sindh government, hopefully something mm -hmm. could come out over the next couple of days. And Punjab government is also in conversation with us. With us. They released and launched Talim Ghar, in which they uh, are running educational content on cable TV channels all across the Punjab districts. So they want also to include some of our content from kindergarten to grade five. Thank you uh, so much, Hassan. Uh, Larib, if you could talk about uh, your experience uh, with regard to COVID and how your organization is adapted to it. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you uh, for taking this initiative. It was really important that someone, uh, it was high time that someone actually talked about these things uh, because um, the world that we knew three weeks ago is completely different uh, to what we have now. Um, coming from a school background, working with a bunch of teachers, students, 
um, I have realized in this, these three weeks that uh, I think we, the world has changed forever. Uh, we will never be working in the same way again. Our students will not be learning in the same way again. Uh, we have, um, it, it is a complete 180 degree shift. Uh, so when this happened, um, actually we, I think none of us had anticipated it. Uh, none of us saw it coming. Uh, but when it was on us suddenly, um, we had a lot of challenges. Uh, a, we had to shift everything to a digital format. And B, we had to constantly um, keep in mind, uh, because we, we work with Cambridge, uh, we work with the IB, uh, and they are the external boards. Um, so we have a set of deliverables that we have to submit to them. We have a certain uh, course content that we have to cover. And the time that this happened was the time when uh, the students are having their internal exams so that they can prepare for their external, which happened uh, somewhere in May and June. Uh, so um, the biggest challenge was how do we conduct exams online? Uh, because ye kabhi bhi nahi hua tha ki hum exams online. Uh, so uh, we had to train our teachers very, very quickly. Again, the training also happened online. Uh, we created, uh, we used a lot of open source tools, uh, free available the, humne unko incorporate kiya, uh, like Google Classrooms. So we made sure that uh, in a matter of few hours, we shifted uh, all our students, all our content uh, onto Google Classroom. And then gradually by taking baby steps, pehle humne, uh, koi video incorporate nahi ki, koi audio incorporate nahi ki. We just put up the, the exam papers, the course content that was to be covered. We put it up online and we started making sure that students start doing it. Uh, we could see that students were struggling. We could see that even teachers were struggling. Um, but uh, within a few days, uh, things started looking better. Um, so we, we got the exams conducted online and then we gradually moved on to having audio and video lectures using again the Gmail, um, the Google uh, open source tools available to us. So um, with the, um, in these two, three weeks, we have realized that uh, we can do pretty much everything that we were doing before. Uh, we were just together in one building, now we're not. Uh, we're not in a in a classroom setting anymore, but we're pretty much doing everything that we were before this. Thank you so much, uh, Lai, for sharing this. Uh, Rabia, if you could uh, move next and talk about your experience as a counselor um, at Hub Academy. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this talk. Um, and just, you know, forgive me for repeating what everybody else said, but really it's, uh, you know, I'm glad that you uh, guys took the initiative to hold this discussion. It's an extremely important one. And I really do think that it's going to change things quite a bit for um, schools and how they operate uh, and just how learning will take place, uh, student behavior, student performance um, in, in, you know, uh, I think the, the months to come. Um, and I think, uh, interesting, and I will speak about this more later, I think that, you know, the current situation that we're in actually um, says quite a lot about the world that we were in um, before coronavirus. Um, so thank you. Um, so um, I'll, I'll first give you a general overview of how my school coped with, um, you know, the, the present health crisis. Um, so if you remember, schools were closed uh, back in, I think, end of February. Uh, when the first few cases came up in uh, Karachi and in Sindh. Um, and I remember that at that point, uh, the Sindh government first said that, you know, we will school, uh, uh, close schools for a couple of days. Um, and then it got closed for two weeks. Um, and then some time passed, more cases came up. And then it got, you know, schools got closed till the end of May. Um, so what actually worked out for us um, in our favor um, and we're, we're lucky, I guess, that, you know, we were already in the process of implementing an online learning system. Um, we previously only used to have it for our O-level students, um, but our school was already planning to have an online, online learning system in place for um, from grade one um, all through um, O-levels. Um, and so we were already in the process of that. And as soon as, you know, this, this um, um, 
you know, this outbreak took place, um, we kind of expedited that process. Um, and then initially we moved everything to Google Classroom. And then once the system was in place and teachers were trained, um, so we kind of shifted everything to that system. Uh, but yes, you know, in the beginning, we were uh, in a state of flux like everybody else. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, um, you know, we also have to train teachers um, about this new learning system that we're putting in place. So um, that was, you know, quite a challenge and quite a lot of work. Um, from a mental health perspective, um, basically what we did was that we made sure that we uh, maintain our communication and I think that's extremely important um, in any time of um, like any crisis situation and especially the one that we are in right now I think it's very important to acknowledge what's happening um, acknowledge the fact that yes there is uncertainty and that yes there is a shift taking place um, um, and so we kind of made sure that we you know maintain that communication uh, not just with students but also with parents um, and um, because our you know we moved to Google classrooms and the online learning System that we had so uh, we also made sure that teachers were regularly checking in with all students um something as simple as like you know just asking them how they've been doing how things are like you know for them uh, since this uh, um since the lockdown a lockdown took place um and apart from that on my end i made sure that you know um that the sessions that i already had um that were, that were going on with with students those uh, continued um so those were some of the things that we were putting into place. Um, but that's not all. I mean, you know, like you mentioned before that this is supposed to be summer vacation, but it not really is. It, it's not really um, so. And I frankly, you know, I can't imagine what these students must be feeling um, because summer vacations is supposed to be a time when you relax, when you travel, when you, you know, just like, I guess, do things at your own pace. Um, and now they're expected to come back in June and, you know, mm. pretend that, you know, all of a sudden like nothing took place and, you know, back into like your regular classroom so quite a lot of I would say cognitive dissonance that's taking place probably in their minds um, but I think right now is the time to kind of step up and um, still provide mental health support to students despite the fact that we are in summer vacation um, because I think that this is a very unusual kind of summer vacation um, so we are still working on that uh, trying to you know prepare a packet for uh, parents and students um, some resources and tools and uh, still working around I would say you know um, how we can continue to provide mental health support not just for students who were um, say coming to me you know before uh, this situation but also students who are now feeling anxious um, and who are now you know have developed these fears um, due to coronavirus so yeah I, I would say still in the process of like you know working things out. Thank you. Thank you, Rabia. I think all of us are in the process of working things out because mm -hmm. uh, it is a situation that has kind of come up really suddenly and we're trying to uh, go with the best solution in this time that we can and, you know, at the same time working on other solutions. Uh, Josefa, I would like you would like to invite you now to talk about some of your work and your organization that you're doing in this time and how you're adapting to this change. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Anam, and thanks for having me here. And uh, and really, it's, it's it's sort of an honor to be uh, part of a panel which has such like brilliant, brilliant individuals. Um, so, so for 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 me, just to give everyone a quick background, uh, the Young Patriot School uh, uh, is, is is a small setup that uh, I co-founded with a few other individuals back in 2013, and we work in Neelam Colony uh, in Karachi, and uh, when I say small setup, we sort of created that, and 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 and, and uh, the idea was to stay small, uh, and and we work with pre-primary grades, and we sort of uh, build a foundation in the community through that, and then try to sort of uh, look for placements otherwise. So that's just the the model that we follow. Uh, so for us, it was. Like like everyone said, it was it was very uh, sudden, and this sort of news and this situation sort of dawned on us, and and for us then then we felt like it was it was the best decision to sort of give an off and sort of announce the holidays and sort of go into vacation mode because for us uh, one thing that was really important for us to consider was that uh, we were. We had children uh, from the age of three to four, 
and and with such young uh, children the immunity is already very low so there there is that health risk additional and secondly there was a lot of anxiety building up among the parents as well a lot of them wanted to sort of go to back to their villages and sort of figure out things and and, and so so that's that was like an immediate response and the other the other side of it uh, that that were that we're now focusing more on is 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 from us as as a team i think it's provided us a brilliant opportunity to sort of pause and reflect on the practices that we had been following uh prior and the practices we sort of we wanted to develop uh, using this time so that i don't know when whenever school reopens or if it does reopen or whatever we're in that we're prepared for that and and that's what that's that's the sort of phase we're currently in we're also currently uh, looking to sort of study the whole dynamic that's going on right now with like surveys within our uh, within the parents within the families that we cater to and trying to find out uh, what internet connectivities do they have uh, what sort of platforms are they using um, if they are using this whatsapp if that's like the most uh, available application that that can be used what are the immediate sort of needs that they have right now emotionally otherwise how are they doing because for us it's also it's also sensitive because uh with a community uh, such as elam calling it, there's a lot of uh one the the finan- financial bit is there so financially uh, the families aren't very well well off and then there's a lot of other uh emotional and and uh, and a lot of like uh there's fear and there's general like uncertainty and there's general grief that that's that's part of their daily lives and now it's just risen to a different level so so we have to sort of work around that sensitivity also and try to gauge what what uh, the feeling is and then sort of develop a response around that but what i'm grateful for is that we have we have this time to sort of figure it out and then respond uh, respond uh, accordingly so so that that's the situation that that we're in so we we're, we're it's it's unsettling but at the same time it's 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 an opportunity that is provided proving to be meaningful because like i said as a team we're now getting the chance to sort of reflect and really think about choices and think about practices and think about the ways forward and, and that i feel is a very meaningful exercise thank you so much uh, for sharing with us and to uh, having uh, because we're also working with low income communities i understand like how sensitive it is and like how every every little thing that we do you know has to be really thought out um i would like to now uh, invite ravya choji to you know share about your experience as a teacher of pakistan fellow um you're teaching at a school in barakahu which is at the outskirts of islamabad and uh, some of please share some of the interesting things that you and uh, your co fellows at teacher of pakistan have been doing so hello everyone uh, first of all thank you for having me and like everyone has already pointed out this is it's so amazing to be here listening to everyone so um just a bit of background about teach for pakistan so our model is that we have uh, fellows like me so there's a 2018 cohort and 2019 cohort that's still uh, working so we uh, the fellows are placed in different schools uh, in different communities outside of islamabad so for example i'm in barakahu i'm in, i'm near barima so these with these communities as i have also pointed out there the set of challenges is very different so the moment uh, ye sara kuch hua it was i think it was 15th of march when uh, schools were closed it was announced that schools were closed so at that moment we sort of felt that um, inaction was not an option for us considering that uh, our students were so they're already at a greater risk of dropping out because if they're losing this the presence of this school they're going to move back to their villages they have so many other challenges financial challenges and the as the importance of learning might sort of drop out of their lives and we, so we wanted to maintain contact with our students and to give them this uh, assurance that we will be there for them and also uh, our place in, in that school that gives us this vantage point that we have this access and this connection with students that will help us understand their needs in this time in a multidimensional way so so we felt that it was a responsibility to reach out to them and to find out what it was that they needed before we could sort of decide uh, what our strategy would be so during the first week we were reaching out to our kids and we were sort of identifying our own constraints in in reaching out you know getting their numbers and then how does how do we make it work and all of that 
And then around 20th of Mar March, we started sitting down as an organization and deciding what our next steps would be. So in that, uh, we felt that uh, we needed to collect, first of all, the data collection. So we started, uh, first of all, collecting data on um, just expanding more on what their needs were. And then also how we could access them, whether they had a phone, if they had a phone, what kind of phone it was. And then also if they had a TV, so it, like uh, as Hassan also pointed out, FDs has this channel which is going to be giving content. So if they had a TV, they could access that. If they had a computer, there was some sort of access, radio. Then if uh, they had internet, whether or not they had internet, and if they had internet, what bandwidth and what could be sent to them. So we started gathering all of this data. Then we also started asking them about uh, their households like how many people are living in that household, who, are, who is our student talking to on a daily basis, and then who in that household has enough literacy or is at a position that they can help us, because we never do this work alone. We always have the household involved in everything. So we uh, identified who could help us. We also identified what our students' routines were and what their uh, household routines were. So. We felt that, so the needs that we identified, uh, first of all, there was this need of Russian, which we felt like, okay, so that becomes an important need. So then we started connecting, uh, we started connecting people in need of Russian to people who were providing Russian. For some communities, we fundraised ourselves and we uh, had uh, Russian, uh, we had Russian drives for those communities. So, but we felt that our vantage point helped us realize that the need was not just physiological and it wasn't just relief that they needed in terms of finance and health. The, our kids were going through this really tough time in which they had lost the safety of that school. Our classes had sort of become a safe space for them. They no, long, they no longer had that space where they could focus on themselves and be away from the troubles that were outside of school. So uh, it was important for them. They were feeling this loss of space and they had lost all of the connection that they had with their teachers and with other students. They had lost that. And then with that, they had lost all structure and routine and they were in this place of uncertainty where they didn't know what was going to happen. And they were worried about everything that was to come, even in terms of education. So with all of that in mind, with all the data we had collected, we then uh, started to make a plan on how to create content and how to deliver it. So then our content was also informed by the needs of the students at that time. We focused on two things. We focused on their well-being, so they could focus on their emotional learning, like how can we help them understand what's going on and process it? How can we keep them physically active? How can we keep them connected? So some of our content is about that. Then there is content about uh, the academic content. And that is also tailored to what is happening right now to help them understand what's happening right now. We want to keep uh, them exposed to the English language, but we're introducing them to words that will help them understand the news and everything that's being going on in English around them. So giving them that literacy with, uh, with subjects like science and social studies, they give them the tools to actually understand things that are happening. For example, I teach social studies and I teach them about citizenship. So as a citizen, what is your civic duty right now? And, or if I'm teaching them about economics, how do you relate that to what's happening right now? Or just even means of communication. So all of that, then um, the content was created. And then so delivery then becomes the biggest challenge. And in that, we had a lot of help from the families themselves. So for example, I reached out to students and I would ask them, okay, yeah, we're planning this distance learning, uh, uh, distance learning curriculum. How can we access you? And even so, we would be surprised by families who did had lost their jobs, did not have food, and they would tell me, "Okay, ma'am, agar education ki baat hai, meri bachi ki taaleem ki baat hai, to main phone le leta hu." So they were prepared to make so many sacrifices for their children. I had family, so there's one fellow who has a father who had identified an office, just called Wi-Fi bahir aate. So every Monday when content is sent, he goes there, he downloads that content, and he comes back. So there's so much that the parents help us with. There's so much that they prepared to do. They identified that my khala ke pas phone hai, I can go there. Or you know, so in that way, we were able to connect to so many students. Students which we who we didn't have numbers for. We had an announcement in a masjid, or us elan se humne kaha ke you know everyone contact your teachers. So they contacted us. When we were doing Russian rise through word of mouth, or when children started getting content, they started contacting contacting us. So as we went along, things sort of got easier and they started figuring themselves out. And then, so 
when it comes to delivering content then so we have some students who have whatsapp and some students who we can just reach through text so what we do is that our content then is um, made uh, we have audio notes we have pdfs we have text messages and all of that so we, that will be delivered to people who have whatsapp for people who don't have whatsapp they get some content over sms and then we have identified focal people within the communities and we can make learning packets and give them to the focal person and students can collect them at a certain time so then that keeps those without whatsapp engaged and then also we have this buddy system where we pair up students with whatsapp with people who don't have students who don't have whatsapp and then they we can enable them with a credit phone credit we've also been looking into that and then those students can take care of those who do not have access so basically we're just going along and figuring things out as they are it's a lot of it is still you know we're still learning as an organization because this is all new for us but what we feel like is that there is an urgency for us to act right now because our students need to know that they haven't lost the connection that they have with us and we feel that while the challenges might look different the the battle that we are fighting is still against inequity and we can't let our students you know lag behind while their you know privileged counterparts can move on through different uh, ways and also that for our students mental health their well being it is very very important that they have some contact because you know other than me reaching out my student will not be talking to anyone the entire day they have no contact with the outer world so it's very important for them to have that connection with us and to have that space so for that we're sort of going along and learning and creating thank you uh, rabia thank you so much for sharing and uh, i loved when you said that you know inaction is not an option and that's so true uh, whether we are jumping right into action or we're pausing and reflecting there is something that we're doing and it's so important uh everything that you people have shared um i can see that the journey has been challenging for all of us and at the same time there is so much hope and inspiration in this um i could relate to a lot of the things that you people were saying uh you know josefa and rabia you were talking about uh connecting with the students for us as an organization also we realized that uh, uh digitizing the content and digitizing student data etc it was always something important and something that we wanted to do uh, but like this situation kind of put it into an urgent uh, you know it became really really urgent um so we started reaching out to students you know some of you talked about having a constant contact with the student that is so important uh, so again you know we designed a survey jahan pe we were looking at uh, the needs of the students and their families if they're safe you know if they're well nourished uh, if they have a uh, basic facilities you know tv radio like you said you know uh, internet phone so everything from the student well being to you know actually uh, delivering learning content how do we make that happen when in the process of collecting that data uh, we're looking at okay you know which of our students use whatsapp which of our students use facebook what are the mediums that our students are already using and engaging them through uh, these mediums and even what i heard from lare and uh, prabhya i suppose that even like the reason of using google classrooms is because you know that one reason also is that this is something that is already familiar with like google and zoom so it's we understand that it's important to kind of reach out to students and uh, do things that are that they're already familiar with um hum jab baat kar rahe hain bachcho ke liye you know content deliver karne ki and content create karne ki so uh, one thing that we did was uh, that uh, there was a story that we had worked on called plus the jadoo so we kind of sprang right in action uh, to animate it you know had a voice over uh, narrated uh, by shahzad and uh, again this like if we had time i wouldn't say that this was the best thing that you know we would have produced uh if we had more time but again you know we felt that waiting for the right product right now was not as important as uh having something you know that we could that could connect with our students and connect to you know students at large and uh, we're now looking at you know how we can develop our content uh the content that we already have you know digitizing it to make sure that you know uh if the school closure continues if it extends you know we can uh we have students uh we have a way to reach out to students and connect with them i think it's also very important when we're thinking about connecting with our students and meeting their needs and the needs of the families uh to look at you know when we look at well being and you know for example rabia you talked about summer vacation so one thing that we did was that 
uh, we had some artists collaborate with us and you know they develop these fun activities fun worksheets coloring sheets uh, that the students can do and they can enjoy in this time so i think it's important to and all of us can think about you know and i'm sure we're thinking about how we can keep our students engaged in this time uh, this entire process for us has been full of challenges and there's so many like you know as and like you said uh, you know as we go into it we realize that okay uh, what more needs to happen and what are the problems we're facing and i would like to ask all of you you know to talk about some of the problems that you had faced in implementing the solutions uh, that you talked about so maybe rabia we could start with you um so um some of the problems that um i faced was i think um i would say like you know a lack of resources perhaps because um um i mean i i'm, I'm the only school psychologist currently working at uh, you know working in my school um uh, so you know i i had to think about you know how many like Uh, students can I possibly reach out to, and we we do have you know our student strength is about I would say a little over thousand students. Um, so you know what is the best way to check in with each of them? Um, and I think what worked best was um, really getting uh, teacher support at this moment, um, and because they were the ones who were interacting with students every day. um it's through you know uh, the online learning system that we have. Um, so you know um. Uh, there were students who who i knew were having you know um who were going through difficult um you know difficult time even before um th this whole thing took place um and those students i already identified um that i knew that you know okay these would require a regular check in say from my end uh, but then there are students who you know um who might not be particularly anxious or stressed but are still experiencing i think that that baseline level of stress that all of us are experiencing um given the situation and so that's where you know teachers kind of stepped in um uh, the other issue that came up was um uh, i would say like student confidentiality because obviously you know previously i was having sessions in person so they would come into my room and you know the whole thing would be private and confidential so how do you do that online you know how do i make sure that there's no one in the background or that you know nobody's reading the students emails and um, you know how how can i kind of ensure that confidentiality um and um i think that you know honestly for that um what works best is um so there are a couple of things um for for older students it worked out well because um and i would say these these are students who are um in grade eight or you know uh, and above so grade eight or grade, uh, or o levels um they do kind of have their privacy you know by this time they definitely own a smartphone and you know they have their own um i think the parents also respect privacy at this age um so it worked out well for them but you know for students who are younger it was better for me to communicate with parents instead and um you know ask them how things are going and you know what challenges are they facing um the other thing was also that you know um i would say that even if you say that you know there's there's a counselor who's um uh, um having you know um a session either on the phone um um or a skype session with a student and they kind of suspect that you know there might be somebody in the background well you know i think that what you should do is definitely still maintain contact i think that you know maintaining contact is absolutely essential um and so what you can do in that moment is perhaps not put the student in spot and like ask them to you know ask them a particular about something that's private but still you know ask them how their day is going what they need help with giving them tips and tools on how they can cope with their uh, daily stress um so those were some of the challenges i would say like you know just just the logistical issues that you know um what what would whatsapp work would email work better would it should it be a phone call um you know how regularly do we check in with students um who should be doing the check in um because again you know like it's it's a school of thousand students so how do you cover each student um but what i would recommend is that you know um really the you know there are a lot of ways to overcome and to work around um these logistical issues i mean i know schools um abroad though who have literally called up every single family and every single parent and asked them how they've been doing and honestly i feel like you know if you have the resources to do that why not um um if you don't if you can't like you know uh, check in like through skype or phone call you can send out a mass email and just you know acknowledging that yes we're going through this time 
and we hope you're doing well. You can also, you know, make a packet um, or, you know, a, a, a packet consisting of tools and resources on how you can cope up with stress and anxiety during this time and send it out to your students. Um, and um, so there, you know, there are a lot of ways to overcome the, the challenges um, that, that one would naturally experience during this time. Thank you for uh, sharing that, Rabia. And uh, as an organization, we're in a right now in a place where just this week our counselor has started reaching out to students. So um, you know everything that you shared would be very helpful for us, and I'm sure you know like for all of us uh, who are watching and listening also. Um, because you know, uh, Rabia talked about older students and younger students and how the needs are different. I'm wondering, Musafa, if you would like to talk about the challenges that you face with this. You're dealing with a particularly, you know, younger group. Uh, it seems like it's easier to kind of work in person or like, you know, they need more human interaction. So how, like, you know, how are you looking at it and what are the challenges that you have faced so far? Josefa, uh, are you with us? Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, just give me a second. I don't know. There's something that's up with this. And I can't seem to figure out okay, where the video has gone all of a sudden. No problem. Uh, would you like us to come back to you, yeah. Sefa? Okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. Figured it out. Right. Sorry, yeah. It's just, I'm doing this for the first time on my phone. I normally do the Zoom thing in my laptop, so now this phone configuration is weird. Um, anyways. <laughs> So yeah, your question uh, about challenges. So I feel like um, with with the younger with the younger lot, uh, it's it's tricky because a lot of our a lot of our curriculum normally uh, would is, was based on very active active learning, and there was sort of like. Would normally take place. Now, uh, now we're still in the process of of, of thinking and sort of uh, reflecting and, and 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 trying to come up with ways how that can be transferred, and also figuring out uh, ways to do that. Uh, so I feel like that that's where that's where the challenge comes in with with elder, uh, with sort of elder uh, age groups. Because they have their own challenges, but I feel like it it still might be easier to sort of have that understanding and have those tools in place. Uh, because instructions and all that can be more, there's more understanding, there's more sort of the cognitive uh, maturity there in place. With with the with the age group that we're working with, what we're now realizing is that we're we're uh, depending a lot on the parents now. So the parental involvement element has gone up uh, by like 200 percent, and and the challenge there and the sensitivity there is that. Um, with with uh, a lot of a lot of them, the families already the family dynamics are difficult, and it's a it's a it's a one room sort of a house where there's like two families living together, and and within that setup, uh, now that the parents are also home, there there's there's all these risks that that are there in terms of the family dynamics sort of uh, you know going haywire and there's. And there's that element, like in in a few of our places, there was already sort of, sort of this risk of sort of violence and abuse in households, and now that has gone up a lot. So 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 we're we're trying to find uh, a way to sort of establish that connection and try to try to find okay maybe identify a few a one person in that household who we could connect with and sort of see okay, at least get an idea first of what's happening with the child currently. And, and also then trying to pass on instructions as to and tutorials and sort of support as to how to sort of keep their learning going. Because it's also important for us to understand right now is that uh, is that like learning is, is not looking the same and it probably won't look the same for a while. And and it's really like a big question for I think all of us to also see okay, what what are we really going towards and what is what is learning really, what does it mean for us at this time? Uh, because for 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 us, it, it's like um, the we're, we're trying to we're trying to see and we're still trying to figure this out. But for now, what we what we've come what we've come to understand is that uh, 
as long as long as the, the child is able to sort of uh, interact with the environment that they're in positively and sort of understand the lived experiences that they're going through that in itself is learning and 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 right now especially because of the dynamic in the household and the family that we're working with what our aim is to sort of support the families in 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 understanding that aspect and just creating environments that that could be safe enough for the child to explore and the child to go on its own because we're already like it we already our school times are, are there's a lot of play and there's a lot of exploration there's a lot of that this classroom time is is not really there like it's not like a classroom you know you're sitting and you're listening and sort of a thing and that that play element can come the brilliance is that that play element can come at home as well the only challenge is that sort of how to communicate that sufficiently to the parents at a time when they're completely stressed out and they're sort of their own schedules and their own dynamics and their own sort of environments are so uh you know overwhelming and and that's a reality like that's something that we have to respect and appreciate that you know that's there so so that that's where we're at and that's interesting it it's sort of an interesting mix of challenges uh and and like uh, but i would like to agree like what what larry said like connection is is key and i think that's what we're also trying to build and with that connection i think that can really be the first step towards finding out like a maybe a more sustainable solution but like i said with with that younger age group there's a lot of that connection depends on the parents and our interaction with the parents and and that is sensitive right now thank you yeah. sefa thank you so much uh, for sharing this and uh, and then literally every topic we talked about in citizenship we study about diversity and about rights and responsibilities so i want to explain to them how social distancing is so important because it's a civic responsibility to take care of others and to think about others and then i want to tell them about they have the right to health right now or they have the right to education and the government is supposed to provide it we study about the government we study about legislative executive so just to give them the terms give them that knowledge so they can understand all of the news that's going around them so that can be for social studies for science it's about disease and it's about viruses and health that's all such a big part of what the study in class even for english so for example if i if we're giving them words for vocabulary so one of the fellows she's giving them words like spread or words like you know humanity social distancing and just things that they're hearing right now just to help them understand what's going on because we don't want our children to feel overwhelmed by everything we want them to navigate through this and to come out of this with increased knowledge and the sense of how we were able to do so much in a time where we were so limited so that resilience is what i want them to take away from this instead of you know feeling isolated or abandoned so that's how we're shaping our content uh thank you so much for sharing uh, rabia resilience uh in this time is so important uh again you know for all all our children and uh, hasan i would like you to now talk about some of your challenges because uh your organization is one that has been working on you know digital content and uh yetly you know like when you started you talked about that you people have also had to go through changes and if you could talk about that and you know uh, the challenges that you faced in the process um all right so see our product over the last 4 years has been primarily designed for schools uh and the way we have set up our application it is used by teachers in classrooms so they uh either have tablets in the hands of students or they have a, a big led tv or a projector and they would run the app uh they would play a video either from our math library science library english or urdu and uh, they could facilitate the video they could pause it in the middle and explain something ask questions uh interact with students and at the end of the video they could take a formative assessment uh so it's a very um it's a very blended experience and it's an experience that sort of requires a facilitator it's not a completely hands off experience now what happened uh with this coronavirus uh we made the app available for free and now what we're having to do we're learning a lot from our users who are downloading the app uh and these are parents 
and sometimes these are just students who are now who are downloading the app and they're looking through the content but for a kindergarten to grade five level student the content still and the experience overall is not at a level where you could say this is completely personalized you just hand over the device and the students would walk out learning uh, everything uh, that there is to learn so uh, that challenge uh, where the experience was designed for a different audience and now it is being used by a different audience in a different use case in a different context that requires uh, fundamental changes that obviously we don't have the time to do so what we are beginning to do is uh, just do some changes in the layout make it available uh, uh, you know in, in different ways so students have quicker access to different deeply seated uh, laid out content and another thing that we're trying to do is reaching to our uh, active uh, user base uh, regularly through uh, in-app notifications, through emails, and uh, also just highlighting some messaging on our social media to bring to parents' attention what all there is on the app. Uh, so, uh, you know, just, uh, just the whole idea of having to pivot uh, and that's the nature of the beast when you are in an, in, 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 you know, in entrepreneurship, when you're starting something. So you've got to be able to uh, be quick on your feet and pivot when there is a need. But this time the pivot is happening in, in a remote office environment where obviously we haven't had uh, a lot of face time with our colleagues. Uh, it's been a little over three and a half weeks, weeks. I think next Monday will be four weeks since we've been working work from home. Uh, so those are some of the challenges. But then there is another challenge. And then uh, that's going to tie into the question that Sana asked on our chat is what are some of the ways to take that content? And I'm going to sort of talk about the national aspect of it. Most of you are practitioners and you're working within your community, within a school, within a confined audience of hundreds of or thousands of uh, students. Uh, so the way we have engaged over the last three to four weeks uh, is at a very national and provincial level. And sometimes just small, uh, you know, small little tweaks uh, could require big fundamental changes. So one example that I'd like to share is that as a community, all of the education technology players in Pakistan, they had formed a, an, an association called Ilm Association. And I'm uh, one of the founding directors and president of Ilm Association. So uh, some of our members, we came together and we said we need a national response. So we, uh, several of our members made uh, many of their paid services and solutions free for uh, for the duration of coronavirus. And I think that spirit is something we don't usually see. You know, we hear about uh, all, uh, all the time in the news that, oh, there was, there was shortage of wheat or there was shortage of sugar and the prices went up, <laughs> you know. So right now, whenever there is demand, there is increased demand prices, tend to go up and that's the basic rule of economic uh, economics and most of our uh, sort of competitors in, in the ed tech space their demand just went up so uh, by that token we should have increased our prices <laughs> but we reduced and completely made our solutions free because we felt that at this time this this is literally a pivotal uh, moment for our industry because we believe that the teachers and principals and a lot of naysayers would see uh, the hidden benefits in technology that the world has been discovering for 15 years. But for some reason in Pakistan, we as a collective unit haven't been able to sort of shift that mindset. Uh, so already uh, technology has a lot to offer, uh, but it cannot replace a, a good teacher in a classroom. And that sort of answers Sana's third question. Like, can technology ever replace a teacher? I don't think technology can ever replace a human being. The moment uh, it can replace a teacher, I think will be the moment when AI and machines and robots will be able to replace all human beings in all aspects because a good teacher is a creative force that you cannot replace unless there is an equivalent or a better creative force that you can design and create with machine learning and robots. I think that time is still a ways ahead unless you believe in what Elon Musk is saying. Uh, and lastly, I would just say that uh, uh, as a as a collective unit, uh, we also have seen something very, very positive from the government side. You know, we've been, at least me as a little entrepreneur, have been knocking on the doors of, uh, of education departments and the secretaries and all of uh, the other officials and then helping them understand, hey, listen, trust me, don't worry about the money or the cost. There is a way to bring technology and innovation into government school. Uh, you know, you spend billions of rupees and billions, uh, or if not, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of billions go unspent every year uh, from the education budget. 
uh, that is allocated for uh, non salary uh, you know vec- uh, verticals it just goes unspent because they don't know how to uh, spend other than buying buildings or furniture or resources so uh, and then suddenly in the covid situation we have not only been approached but we have seen a lot of positive engagement and i think that could be like sort of an entry points for uh, our company and some of our uh, fellow competitors to uh, help 60% of pakistan's uh, k to 12 space you know 60% of the students are somehow in that public school ecosystem and that shift is happening you know federal government is saying okay ptv they are buying 12 hours of transmission on ptv starting from the 10th and they are saying we will not stop when the covid 19 stops we will continue to run four five six hours of education uh, time on tv ptv or create our own channel so that kind of shift has suddenly come in and you know that this government has been talking about it for two years but uh, you know there there was so much inertia uh, to look into this and this is uh, there is an opportunity for 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 people like myself my colleagues and people who are working in this space sorry i think my video uh, paused for a while um nasim thank you so much uh, for sharing and aapne jo baat ki positive engagement ki so true and you know we're in this time where you know again like somebody said in action is not an option similarly you know matlab there is we cannot run away from technology now you know it's it's there we have to embrace it and the question is you know how do we embrace it and how do we embrace it in a way where uh we maximize our potential as human beings and we maximize uh, the use of technology uh flare you know i know that you people use uh, work with the ib system and there's a lot of hands on learning over there and i wonder you know if you could talk about that and you could talk about you know your challenges in uh when you convert it from of uh, the classroom to the digital space uh, how the hands on learning has been impacted and what you're doing about that um so uh, yes the ib is uh, all about hands on learning it's all about um out of the box learning it's where you step out of your comfort zone you let go of the books notebooks traditional softboard pe likh raha hai teacher or uh, whiteboard pe likh raha hai teacher or softboard pe aapke um uh, flash cards lage hue hain all that traditional uh, system it's 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 completely stepping out of it so um i think in these circumstances uh we did really see the ib emerging as you know the answer to so many problems that we face uh if we faced in the post covid world um uh, as far as the content creation is concerned um yes uh, we do have to now slightly deviate from the way we were creating content before this uh we know that we cannot physically interact with the students we cannot take students outside for example agar hum um biology pad rahe hain aur we have to go and really collect samples um uh, plants leaves uh have uh, uh, and you know all sorts of go and see how a fish pond is like and usme se samples lena and hydroponics and all of those things yes we cannot do that anymore because we really cannot interact with that with each other um and we we cannot step out of our house but we can do so much um even uh, within the boundaries that we currently have so i'll tell you an example uh, one of our uh, student groups from grade 8 they were doing a community project uh, which was completely different before all of this um began but they uh, shifted their course of action and now those kids are making sanitizers at home from the ingredients and from the uh, equipment and from material available at home so um this is this is just one example like i see eighth graders they're making sanitizers they're packing them in bottles and they're you know ready to uh, give it out also once they are actually allowed to step out of their houses and you know go out there um uh, and um and w- i think rabia was also talking about this that you have to teach uh, in a way that the students find more engaging in the current situation uh, because um yes 
you do have to understand that uh, they are exposed to a lot of um, news negative negativity coming through uh, either social media or tv and, and and you know they they know that people are dying all over the world there is a, there is a lot of negativity around them um, and but but hope is the answer so you ha you have to instill hope in them by by teaching them the content by teaching them in a way uh, that that is hands on and that is something that they can find uh, they can relate to so for example in economics uh, you are learning about how the market is going up and down uh, in biology you are researching about all of this um, in computer science i see my students making apps uh, on you know what to do in, in in an emergency situation so they're making small prototypes but you know it's it's they they find it more engaging because they can relate to it more it's helping them fight the negativity that is around them and it is helping them move ahead with the content that we have to teach them uh, but I feel like um, in, in middle years, in primary years, you get that room uh, much more than you do in the senior years because you do have a, uh, an external board that just ka exam dena hai. Exam agar nahi bhi ho ra, to aapko wo curriculum padna hi hai. You have to be in that group all the time. Um, so that is a completely different volume. Now that is up to the teacher how to make sure that the student stays on track uh, while preparing for an external examination that is not happening now, but is going to happen sooner or later. Um, but in, on the other hand, making it more engaging, making it more interesting, making it more relatable. Um, so th that is one of the challenges that, that uh, we as a community, as a community of teachers are facing. Then if I, if I look at it from a school admin perspective, uh, we have to, one of the major challenges is to make sure that, uh, you know, the teachers are also up to date uh, with their, um, when it comes to using softwares. So, for example, um, again, I'll give you a live example. Uh, we have a teacher who is um, who's 70 plus years old um, and, you know, has um, is very firm in his ways. Um, because he's taught for so many, he's ta taught for decades, and he's taught in a specific way, and he's he really like understands the subject. He really understands the way he teaches, and he he's very firm in his ways. But um, you know, now I see him um, using Google Calendar, using Google Meets, using Google Classroom. Like he would, he calls me up and says, "Now, how do I add students? How do I add their guardians? How do I?" hold this video meeting, how do, and I, and you know, it's, it's so refreshing because um, you see people are stepping out of their comfort zones. People are, people are ready to, you know, put their skills to a test, ready to learn new things. I have seen a lot of growth in uh, my students, in my, in my faculty as well, uh, because now that everybody has to do things a certain way they are uh, you know really trying to up their game they're trying to make sure that the students are more involved in their lessons they are delivering the content but they're also keeping it interactive um, and as for um, your question about you know what tools to use because there are uh, certain apps and softwares that you can log into and then disappear and then there is right really no uh, way of checking whether whether you were online for that period of time. So uh, that also, again, comes to uh, the way a teacher decides to take his or her uh, course of action forward. So um, uh, I have seen my teachers uh, do, do it in uh, multiple ways. So some of the teachers, they uh, put content up and then they, uh, so depending on what they're teaching, they uh, they like make it a learn at your own pace kind of a thing. So uh, th there is that, but then there's also interactive lessons involved. Ab, uh, dusra hamari senior classes mein or O levels mein, A levels mein, masla ye hai that you have to keep testing kids because sooner or later there is going to be an exam. Uh, and you have to make sure that your students uh, do not forget the, con the content that you've been trying to teach them for two years or more than two years. So then you have to 
test them you have to quiz them now you know that they're sitting at home you can't uh, physically go and check uh, so uh, how do you make sure that the testing that you're doing is um, actually 100% um, you know the, the results are 100% authentic um, so um, then there are multiple ways that i see teachers uh, trying to to fight fight this issue and that is um, for example one of our teachers uh, put up a google form which had um, an mcq test and it was a time test so for example 10 minutes do this quiz and submit the answer so um, they had a they had a google meets where they discussed a topic and then at the end of it 10 minutes may they had a google form which was made available to them there and then and after 10 minutes it was take, taken down so it had an mcq uh, test on it so um, that is one way of testing but then uh, th th that is one way of uh, traditional testing how do you test uh, when you know that you really cannot test in a in a controlled setting so then you have to figure out ways uh, for that as well how do you test when you're not actually testing. So you have to give them research projects. You have to give them, uh, you know, a, a stuff that uh, that is out of the box, that is not there in the book, uh, where you know that the student has to step out of their comfort zone, go research themselves, uh, find out the answer, and, uh, you know, solve that problem. So uh, that has to be hands-on. That has to be interactive. The teacher has to be available. Uh, all the time for help. Uh, and it also has to, at the end of the day, meet the learning outcome. Uh, because you, you, we don't know how, how long is this going to last. Is this going to last for another two months? Is, is it going to last for another year? We don't know. We don't know when is this coming to an end. We don't know when will we be able to return to school. And there'll be a day when we'll be finally able to put this behind us. So there is that, uh, you know, complete cluelessness about when are things coming back to normal. So keeping your learning, keeping your uh, your classroom setting normal, making sure that you're delivering the content, but making it interesting enough um, is a challenge. And also uh, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, the thing that we were talking about in the beginning, that students think it's the summer break because there has been news going around that from June onwards, a new academic year is going to begin. So um, they know that one and a half month, hai, probably this is our summer break. Hai. So June, we have to come back and a new class. So why are we studying now? And so uh, that, that, this is a challenge. And then, um, how Head Start has done it is that we have exactly our timetable in place. So nothing has changed. For example, if, if at 8.15, there's a Pakistan studies class that is going to end at 9.15, we make sure it is that way. So um, then there's a lunch break. So the lunch break is where it was when um, there was normal school. So from 8 to 3, we have to make sure that the timetable is followed the way it was being followed uh, in regular school so uh, then the, uh, this is this is a good thing because you have to make sure that the student stays in practice wo routine kharab na ho unki wo 12 baje na uth rahe ho wo sari sari raat na jaag rahe ho uh, uh, unka jo screen time uh, uh, curriculum development uh, uh, curriculum delivering ke liye hai wo screen time so hai hi lekin uh, uske ilawa what what they're watching at night and you know that their, their routine is not disturbed so that was one thing but then we have to we have to um, struggle because the kids don't want to wake up in the morning um, it, it's kind of like chutiya uh, hain then they do you know so attendance issues and all that is also one of the one of the challenges but i see that getting better uh, I, it was we were struggling with it in the beginning, but now uh, when they see that that the classrooms are so uh, interactive, the learning is going on. Their their friends are coming online, and you know they also find it as an escape from all the negativity that is around them. Um, the one thing I would like to share, which happened a few days ago, uh, we were in a we were in a live meet session, and. Um, I, there was another class going on. I, I had my mic mute, but then I could hear 
my students and I, I, I heard them after a long time. So I couldn't help resisting. I, 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 I uh, turned my mic on and I said, it, I cannot even tell you guys how uh, refreshing it is for me to hear your voices again. And you know, um, to know that you're actually fine and you're doing well and you're, you're coping up with all this negativity. And uh, I, I could see the same reaction from them. And they were like, that is exactly what we were feeling right now. That, you know, hearing from our teachers, hearing familiar voices and, you know, uh, talking to our friends and uh, interacting with our teachers, learning, everything is normal. So that is, um, that was a plus point, you know, after all those challenges, uh, and all of those things but then there are positive things which become a highlight of the day which are keeping the parents and the students going as well thank you uh, so much Lareb, uh, for sharing with us so comprehensively both your challenges as well as your success stories because um, to success stories, you know, they give us hope and like you said, uh, we don't know what the next few months or even the next year is going to be like. So, you know, it's it's important for us to keep ourselves motivated. I also like, you know, when you were sharing the story of your students, I was realizing, you know, this thing I read somewhere that basically, like, you know, it's about physical distancing and not social distancing. And, you know, the fact that it's so important for us to, you know, keep in touch with each other and whether it's our teens or our students or parents, communities, you know, it's important for all of us. Um, when you talk about it, you know, you talk about a lot of things. And uh, one thing that stood out for me was structure. And I think the structure is so important for the students, uh, especially when they're at home. Uh, and you know, for example, as an organization, when we're looking into it, uh, that, you know, we have a huge, uh, we're like catering to more than, you know, around 3,500 students uh, with government teachers, with different teachers, you know, how do we, how do we implement that structure? So the first step for us was to uh, digitize the content and curate content and make sure that you know we have everything digital and online uh, so that you know if need be we can move towards the system but we also realize that you know that is not enough just having a video up there is not going to solve this problem so uh, I would like to ask you know those of you who worked on developing your own content how do you make the content engaging and this is also one of the questions that we have um, from the people who are uh, watching uh, our discussion, that they're asking that, Kya hai? is it important that uh, your content is in the form of a video? Uh, and what are some of the ways that we can, uh, you know, make the content engaging for our students and reach out to our students? Asin, maybe, you know, you could talk about it because, you know, you work so much on the digital content. Okay, so uh, first thing that I'd like everybody to realize is that it is extremely, extremely difficult and a tedious process to create a uh, visual content. Uh, yes, you can uh, put together a nice document, you can make a nice presentation, but if you want uh, something that uh, captivates your audience, then has to have uh, uh, basically a complete, uh, you know, sort of package that uh, you would see in any video. So you can take notes from movies, shows, uh, the best thing you watch on YouTube, how do they drive engagement, has to have a certain pacing, has to have an element of story, has to have uh, visuals that go well with the narrative, has to have a well-scripted uh, sort of a flow. So all those things uh, I think would make uh, a nicely created professionally designed content. Uh, but I think for teachers, uh, I would strongly recommend for them to use tools that are already available, which allow them to share links and maybe edit videos that they could get from YouTube or maybe suggest to students, you know, watch this video from this uh, point onwards and then stop watching at that point. Uh, there's plenty of good and excellent content available, especially if your students uh, don't have uh, a language barrier they can watch videos in Urdu as well as in English then I think it's wonderful content you can find on YouTube plenty of it would relate to any curriculum uh, and math and science concepts are mostly universal so it's easier to uh, 
you know, share those resources. And if you really, really want to create your own content, if you are, let's say you're a passionate creator and you want to create content for your students, which you think you can't find anywhere else. Why? Because maybe you have a certain context and you want to connect with your students in a personal way. Uh, then sometimes uh, just, uh, just holding up your phone and just talking into the camera uh, could also work if you have a wonderful way of uh, telling your story and if you can build a narrative and if you uh, can uh, explain to students uh, whatever you're trying to explain in a nice way. So there are really low cost resources available. You can have a little tripod, you can buy for 1000 rupees, have a little camera stand, uh, a little whiteboard. Uh, live uh, video cast uh, on Facebook or YouTube. So uh, in terms of what's available to all of us, uh, I think this uh, COVID-19 has really given us this realization that technology has been outpacing human adoption for years. We are literally easily 15, 20 years behind uh, all the tools that are out there. You know, how to use those tools, that kind of knowledge, practice and experience is what we don't have. Uh, you know, and, and there's just so much to learn. So it's almost impossible for anybody to uh, become really, really good at uh, at anything. And I, I would also just relate to uh, what the medical pre uh, practitioners are experiencing. You know, everybody's talking about ventilators, ventilators. That's a piece of technology, right? And then suddenly when uh, so many ventilators became available, the second thing people started thinking about is who's going to use them? It's such a sophisticated equipment. You need hours and hours of training. So the human element, we tend to forget uh, that uh, when you bring in the human, you don't need you don't always need the best technology. Just pick the right tool, the technology that whoever the user is that they're comfortable with. And if Google Classroom works for you, wonderful. But for many schools, for many teachers, especially mid-income and low-income schools, Google Classroom is going to be extremely complicated. So that's not the solution for them. So maybe WhatsApp is their solution. And uh, somebody mentioned in a question, what are some really low-cost strategies to reach out to your audience? I heard some amazing stories of you know announcements from the mosque and those kinds of things really resonate uh, uh, with the communities. Uh, so in one of the meetings that I attended, uh, there was uh, an idea that somebody floated about using the newspaper delivery boys to deliver SD card that have a lot of content that could go to remote communities. You know, so uh, even uh, out of the box ideas like these could could work for for a community that's uh, really really remotely located. Uh, TV is there. Uh, there is some idea of exploring radio, but sadly radio is just not uh, being uh, used as frequently. And then there was an idea about, hey, listen, before the elections, we all received Imran Khan's phone call on our mobile number. You know, my name is Imran Khan. And then, you know, and then he went about uh, his uh, mandate and then whatever uh, the political speech that there was. But if you could bring on board these telcos and they could, uh, you know, deliver a four, five, six minute audio lesson, and, you know, and, and that is something that could also scale to millions. So delivery ideas have to be explored. Uh, what works for our context, that has to be explored because somebody said in our, uh, in our panel that, uh, uh, and that, that a lot of uh, epidemiologists also believe that, you know, we'll have to live with this coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, and it will just become part of our lives, we'll remain socially distant for some time, then we'll be used to it, uh, we'll use technologies in new and novel ways. So maybe uh, we have to explore, uh, the, you know, the whole nine yards of technology and find the one that suits our needs because there's plenty of uh, uh, like a long list of tools that's available and not if not there's no one size fits all thank you so much Hassan. and uh, i liked what you talked about the fact that one solution doesn't fit everyone um, and some of the questions that we've been getting on the group are just like, you know, somebody asked us that what are some of the low tech ways to reach out to communities? Because uh, if 60% of our students are going to uh, government schools, um, access to internet, smartphones, laptops, etc. is not a luxury that many of them have. Um, somebody here wrote something very valid that they said that, you know, they're wondering if this gap, like, you know, this pandemic is going to widen the learning gap between the privileged and the unprivileged. And maybe we could spend this time, we have like, I think about 15 minutes left, uh, talk about like, you know, five minutes to talk about some of the things that we think that we've been doing or we think uh, that can work uh, to ensure that this gap doesn't widen 
and to make sure that we're able to reach out to students and the creative ways through which we can reach out to our students and communities. Uh, if any of you would like to share some of these ideas. Yeah, I, uh, Anam, if I, if I can, if I may. Um, yes. So this is a very, very important, a very interesting question and a very real, real dynamic that, that sort of we are uh, facing at this point in time. And I feel like uh, we, we, the one way to look at it is to sort of uh, take a step back and to see, okay, because we are, we are generally in this, in this, uh, even the pre-corona world or existing corona world, I think we're, some, some of our, 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 our uh, patterns or our attitudes are, are being called upon to be shifted a little because we were always in this, in this mode of comparing and this mode of seeing, ke, oh, okay, uh, how is, is someone who's going to mainstream school doing, doing as compared to someone who's, who's in a government school? Uh, or in a, in, a, in a less privileged sort of community or less privileged school. And this constantly is comparison and this, and this, this race in a way to sort of uh, see where, where that takes us. And I feel like right now is, 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 a, is a brilliant opportunity for us to sort of pause and sort of think about is that, is that really what, what we are aiming for? Because yeah, as much as like, it's, already, it's, all, it's also like something that's calling on us to be practical and to really rationalize and think that Okay, within the given situation, within the circumstances that we have currently, uh, what is this, what is sort of the best best uh, foot forward that we can we can have? And like I said earlier as well, when we were in uh, uh, before this this question came out, we were talking about uh, the tools and the platforms to use and what are available to what communities and all of that. I feel like. That is still for me, is it maybe a secondary question and a, and a primary question for me at this point would be, what is the content? What, what, are, we, what are we wanting to teach? What are we wanting uh, the students or the communities to learn from this? And, and that would really drive the platforms and the sort of delivery channels we use. And I feel like as, uh, as Hassan also suggested, like there's, there's, there's brilliant ways to sort of uh, innovate and create delivery patterns. I feel once we, once we sort of understand what is the, what is what what is the content that you want to give out and and what and that will really drive from uh, the sort of need assessment that we do from the communities that we're serving so the needs of, of someone from a privileged background would be different I, I imagine them to be slightly different than what they would be for someone who is from a not so privileged background or from a house of let's say uh, so a child uh, staying in a house of 15 people living in one room as compared to a child who has his own room and has all the technology available. At the same time, both uh, reaching out and, and taking an action for both communities is important. And I feel like each one of them has their demands a, a, a different and a very sort of tailored approach. And at this time, if if we sort of if we sort of get into the get on the bandwagon of sort of comparing and trying to find kids okay, are we doing enough that, that this will help uh, the child give the same exam or get the same results as someone who is from a mainstream school? I feel like that, that might be limiting at this point to, to, to really consider because we're right now dealing with, with questions and with challenges that are, that are bigger than that. Uh, and, and it's really sort of what, we, what the lessons that we give at this time uh, really would shape how the children and the, the, the families also that we're serving really sort of understand and, and realize the kind of approach that is needed to sort of build this forward and really come out stronger. So I feel like that's just, that was just my two cents on that question. Uh, it's very real, but I feel like we sort of need to also understand the dynamics that, that are at play here. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk about this as well. So when we started uh, started uh, deciding about humne is pandemic ke ab, what are we going to do and all of that. So it is very real that our children are at the children that I teach are at a disadvantage because because they haven't received the same sort of privilege. They don't have the same sort of resources right now. There are a lot more constraints for them. And it is also very real that the consequences of this pandemic and everything that's happening right now are going to be much harsher for them. They are at a risk of dropping out of school. They are at risk of falling behind. The education gap is already so big and it's going to get bigger. So 
with all of that in mind before we sat down and thought of you know what are we going to do right now we decided to forget the constraints and think about what we would want for these kids because i believe they deserve everything that they privileged uh, their privileged counterparts do so considering that so we put all the constraints aside and we thought of okay you know hum in bachcho ke liye kya chahte hain if i personally talk about it i would want the same thing for my students that i want for my brother but honestly i would want more for my students because my students are already like so there is so much more that these kids need and i think it's very important to first realize that and with that it's important to realize ke you know now there's all this constraints but we also need to step up and make more of an effort so constraints hain yes but the kids are also at such a huge risk that we have to step up and so that's the sort of faith that we've been operating with and so we decided to you know we we decided did everything we could do we constrained say how do we work around them we came up with a plan a and a plan b and a plan c and we keep evolving as we go along so what, what how so how we feel about this as an organization is that it's an iterative process it's going to keep happening we can't wait for a perfect solution to come by and you know start then so to so sort of how we feel about this gap is that yes it's very real and it's something that we struggle with that's something it's something that we've always struggled with since we started this work so now it's just the challenge is the same it's just that we have to go about it a different way so that's sort of the mindset that we're operating the, with and we're trying to do everything that we can to you know minimize the effect that's going to have that this gap is you know sure maybe there will be a higher gap after this but we can you know make it make it better we can stop it from being worse so and that's the least that we can do what we can do during this time so for example what i would want to share is that during this time the conversations that i've had with my students i've had one on ones with them the kind of data that i've collected about them it's it's so much it's so much better it's so much more detailed it's so much more connected than the data that i had before so this pandemic it's also an opportunity it's an opportunity to connect with my students to find out more about them to show them that i can be resilient and if i can be resilient they can also be resilient and that you know to make them uh, so so what we thought about is ki jab hamare bacche iske baad kahan par honge what's the new skills that they should have developed and what should have happened so when i go back to my classroom once all of this is over i'm going to have a wall dedicated to you know how did we survive this time what did we do we did not give up we had you know to so we are having activities where we take pictures and we connect them to students and then when we go back to that class we're going to have this um, we're going to have this wall this time this memory of how how resilient we were during this time how much more we learned and how much we grew during this time so i feel like while the constraint is real the gap is real there's still that uh, still a lot that we can do and this is a unique opportunity as well so that's sort of how i feel about all of this I think uh, Anand's uh, videos or the connection is paused. Uh, so uh, you know, somebody somebody mentioned that this uh, um, in the question feed that how do we make sure that at this time these students who were already disadvantaged they are not further disadvantaged. Thank you uh, so and much for sharing. This remains uh, this remains a big challenge uh, because. Uh, i think uh, uh already these schools didn't have enough resources didn't have teachers uh who uh were well trained well equipped these schools uh, where these low income community students uh go to they already didn't have the resources and now uh with them having to stay at home that means they have even less access uh so at this time i guess tv could be um one strong medium um we cannot deny the fact that 165 million uh, uh, mobile phone connections connection uh, are in pakistan so uh, 
you know, feature phones could be utilized to uh, create an interactive experience at a very limited scale uh, with students. Uh, and technology does have room to play uh, using TV, interactive media on the phone, and maybe 78 million people have uh, smartphones and almost uh, most of them know how to use WhatsApp. Uh, so, you know, maybe creating a, a bot that uh, uh, talks to students uh, using machine learning and artificial intelligence, the technology is available uh, that uh, over the next few months, there could be solutions out that help these students not only uh, catch up, but also race ahead uh, in some cases, because the good thing about technology is that I think it's a bigger equalizer uh, than education. And sometimes because education isn't delivered at the same uh, quality and at the same level to all people, but the network connection, the 3G, 4G, uh, it uh, it is given with some, obviously with some uh, uh, discrimination, but uh, even somebody who has a hundred rupee connection, they can also enjoy a YouTube video. They can enjoy a good lesson that's available that's out there. So I think there are low cost technology based solutions available, which some people, some innovators and entrepreneurs would explore and would come out, uh, not only to help the privileged, but also those uh, that have limited means. Uh, so that's my that was my thought. Thank you uh, so much, Hassan, and thank you so much, everyone. Um, it was a very enlightening talk. Uh, I would just like to sum up some of the themes that came up uh, during our conversation. And uh, one thing which was common was that it's important to uh, identify needs of our students. And after we do needs assessment, whether our, uh, it doesn't matter where our children are coming from or whether we're reaching out to a larger you know, audience on TV or whether we're reaching out to students of a particular school, uh, it's the needs uh, that will tell us. Meanwhile, it's very important to stay in touch with our students uh, for ourselves, you know, to stop, pause, uh, reflect, and then based on that, you know, try something. And it's going to be a process of action and iteration rather than finding a perfect solution and then going with that. And we talk about action and iteration. Uh, it's again, you know, we would be looking at, we're looking at multiple ways over here. So we're looking at content that's already available. We're looking at using TV, using radio, but even using WhatsApp, maybe sending uh, voice notes. Uh, I like the example of the Imran Khan Wali for uh, call uh, as in that you gave. Uh, so there are a lot of these uh, different uh, ways through which uh, we can reach out to our students and it's important for us to know which medium that our students are uh, already using. Uh, engaging with parents is something that came up as uh, very important. Uh, engaging with parents is something that came up uh, very, which is very important. Uh, and having engaging content and having content, uh, and again, you know, finding different ways of learning. Uh, we also talked about something that came up in the questions was uh, whether this technology will replace the teacher. And I think all of us agreed that the technology is not replacing the teacher, but the technology is definitely changing the role of the teacher in the learning process. And it's, we're, you know, all happy to see that everyone is kind of evolving in the process and there are lots of challenges, but all of us are getting there. Uh, thank you once again. Our full discussion uh, will be available on our Facebook page and your YouTube uh, channels tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. This was brilliant. Thanks a lot.